Welcome to Brain of Vet. We are joined by John Martin Fisher, and we're going to be talking about free will and moral responsibility. Would you like to start with a thought experiment? Yes, famous thought experiment that came from a paper by Harry Frankfurt in 1969. There are many of these examples in the history of philosophy, but Harry Frankfurt gave a particularly sharp and sophisticated version. So let's do it this way. Joe is deliberating about um, whom to vote for in the election. She can vote for, let's just use the U.S. Uh, <laughs> political parties, the Democrat or the Republican. Let's say those are her two choices. And she's one of these undecided voters. I've never understood them, but she's waited till the very end to make her decision. She deliberates and on her own, for her own reasons, she chooses to vote for the Democrat and does so. Intuitively, she acts freely and she could be held morally responsible if there were some reason why we would be interested in her responsibility for voting for the Democrat. But unbeknownst to her, a neurosurgeon implanted a chip in her brain and the chip is monitoring her brain activities and neurosurgeon monitors it through this chip. And she, the neurosurgeon can see if Jones were about to choose to vote for the Republican and vote for the Republican. So if she's about to vote, choose to vote for the Republican, the chip uh, is triggered and electronically stimulates her brain in such a way that it ensures that she does choose to vote for the Democrat. This is all in the alternative sequence, but in the actual sequence, the chip doesn't get involved at all, doesn't get triggered. So intuitively, according to Frankfurt, and I think he's right, Jones freely chooses to vote for the Democrat and does vote for the Democrat freely and could be held responsible, though she couldn't have done otherwise. In virtue of this setup, we sometimes call the situation preemptively overdetermined. She cannot choose to vote for the Republican. She cannot vote for the Republican. And yet she does so freely. I love the thought experiment because it elicits so many different problems around free will. So one of them is that we think that we are only free if we could have done otherwise. So a particular action that we performed is only free if we could have done otherwise. Let's just assume that that principle is true. Um, so in this case, Jones is not free, but at the same time, it seems that Jones is morally responsible for his action because he chose to vote Democrat and the chip never fired. So it seems like he went through all the required steps that we need to be morally responsible for our choice. So he's both not free and he's morally responsible for his choice. And that seems bizarre because it seems intuitive that you are not morally responsible for a choice that you make, which isn't free. And I love that it generates this paradox, apparent paradox. Yeah, it ger generates the apparent paradox. And it's also great because it challenges the traditional orientation for millennia, really, which had it that you need alternative possibilities or freedom to do otherwise, freedom to choose otherwise in order to be responsible. And there have been lively debates for centuries and actually continuing now about whether, say, causal determinism is compatible with freedom to do otherwise, whether God's foreknowledge is compatible with freedom to do otherwise. And what the thought experiment suggests is we could sidestep those debates if we're really interested in moral responsibility, because responsibility doesn't require the kind of freedom that's at issue in these debates. That would be a big deal. That would be philosophical progress. Now I would say though, that key for me is to distinguish two different kinds of freedom. So freedom to do otherwise and acting freely or freedom to choose otherwise and choosing freely. So in the example, I agree, Jason, with your characterization that the agent isn't free in the sense of free to do otherwise or choose up. But I'd say Jones still acts freely and chooses freely. So Jones has a kind of freedom, but not the traditional kind of freedom to choose and do otherwise. So that strikes me as an important distinction to draw. So you can imagine if she had deliberated and elected to, to pick a Republican candidate, and then the switch compels her to choose Democrat, we might say, well, clearly you did not um, choose freely, your hand was forced, and we can't hold you responsible because there's the supervening event which happens. 
But in the other case where you've done the deliberation, where there is no interference with your choice and you exercise it, well, then we think we can hold you accountable. And I suppose the question really is, where do we find ourselves ordinarily in the world? If we, if we have in a situation where basically you have a causal determinism, so as soon as the big bang goes off, a chain reaction happens and there is no choice that any of us had but to be having this conversation right now, where does the moral accountability rest? Can that, does that distinction play a role in our ordinary lives? In my view, we're responsible when we are and if we are in virtue of acting freely. I use a little different terminology. I talk about control, although I, I go back and forth between the more traditional idea of freedom and control. What I would say is we're morally responsible insofar as we choose and act freely or exhibit guidance control over, of our actions. So I distinguish regulative control, which is freedom to do otherwise, or access to alternative possibilities from guidance control. Uh, it, the kind of control, which is like freely guiding or in an unimpaired way, guiding a car or a plane, let's say, but it, it, and guidance control is usually accompanied by regulative control. But what's interesting about the Frankfurt cases, the thought experiments is that they separate guidance control from regulative control. And what I say is responsibility is grounded in acting freely or guidance control. Further, I would say that we can have such control, even if everything we do is is determined, even if causal determinism is true, or for that matter, if God exists and has comprehensive foreknowledge of our choices. And now you say, well, but wouldn't those conditions, causal determinism or God's foreknowledge rule out freedom to do otherwise? I say, yeah, it's, yes, it's plausible that that's the case, but that's not required. That kind of freedom is not required for moral responsibility. So I chose, uh, you presumably invited me of your own free will or, or freely, and I freely accepted your invitation and that it, but it still may be true that determinism is true. We don't know that it's false. And intuitively, I think even if we found out that determinism is true, we would still think that we freely engaged in this conversation. So that's the sketch of an answer that I'd like to give to Mark's question. So I want to distinguish two different problems here. So the, the one problem is whether free will or free choice, depending on which conception you want to use, is compatible with determinism. So that generates this compatibilism, incompatibilism debate. Um, and on that, I'm a died in the world libertarian. So I'm an incompatibilist. So I think that uh, the two are not compatible. You, you have to have causal indeterminism in order to uh, have free will. And it just so happens we have the right kind of indeterminism, so we have free will. So that's that's my position on that. So I want to I want to talk about that at some point. The other the other debate is whether, regardless of whether we're free, whether alternative possibilities are required for moral responsibility. So I just want to return to that for a moment. In the original case, I wonder whether we can't resist Frankfurt's intuition that we morally responsible, that or that Jones is morally responsible just because the chip in, in Jones's brain doesn't get triggered. We might say, well, it seems like because there's over-determinism here, so because regardless of Jones's parent choice, just before the choice, Jones is going to choose Democrat. It, I just worry that there's the wrong kind of causal chains that we normally take to involve moral responsibility. And if we tease that out a bit and discuss that, maybe our intuition will change. Okay, so I don't know if it's fair for me to ask, but I, I'm wondering um, whether you could say more about that, because what I would say is, so we distinguish between the actual sequence and the alternative sequence. And for me, we look at the way the actual sequence unfolds in order to ascertain moral responsibility. And the way the actual sequence unfolds in these thought experiments is just like we ordinarily would take it the sequence to go when someone is morally responsible. There's just no difference from an ordinary case where we assume moral responsibility. Now, of course, there are skeptical 
questions about whether we're justified in making that assumption, especially if causal determinism is true, but even if indeterminism is true. But ordinarily, we take it that sometimes we're morally responsible for our choices and actions. And sometimes uh, we, we act freely, we choose freely and act freely. And in the Frankfurt cases, the way the story goes is just like in those ordinary cases where we assume moral responsibility. So in the alternate sequence, in the alternative scenario, things go awry, as it were. And I would say in that scenario, the agent is not morally responsible. Things don't go as we assume they must go in order for responsibility. So one important um, characteristic of a proper analysis of these cases is to distinguish the actual sequence from the alternative sequence. And my approach I call an actual sequence approach to moral responsibility, motivated by the Frankfurt cases, though I'm not sure you need to. And that term has been picked up by Carolina Sartorio, very interesting contemporary philosopher who develops it in some ways in a much more sophisticated way than I do. So that's very interesting. But what worries me is that perhaps the correct perspective is neither the actual sequence nor the alternative sequence. So not just looking at one of these sequences, but the, perhaps the correct perspective is looking at both next to each other and saying, it worries me that things are going awry in the one case, and sure, things are going well in the other, but it worries me that things are going wrong in the one case. And that suggests to me when we look overall and take both sequences into perspective, into our cognition, that there's a problem. Okay, well, don't be such a worry word. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually, good question, good worry, but the way I would put it is, you're very much within the traditional framework of, as you put it, libertarianism or the alternative possibilities framework. As the Argentine writer Borges put it, the garden is a, the future is a garden of forking paths. So the forking paths picture of our freedom. And with it, if you accept that, I agree, you have to look at each sequence, the actual sequence and the alternative sequence. And in order for it to be plausible that the individual is freely acting in the actual sequence, there must be an alternative sequence available to the agent in which she also acts. So there has to be what Robert Kane, the great uh, contemporary libertarian philosopher calls plural uh, voluntary control. There have to be more than one sequence available to the agent in which she acts freely. And I think that's where you are situated kind of analytically and why you feel the way you do. But if you reject that, if you go in the direction of an actual sequence theory, then all you need to do is focus on the properties, perhaps non-dispositional, but also perhaps dispositional properties of the actual sequence. And it doesn't matter really what is happening and if things go awry in the alternative scenario. It's only relevant if you continue to buy into the traditional garden of forking paths framework. At least that's my view. So what worries me is I just don't have a good intuition for why we should choose one over the other. So, so th this is where I always get stuck in the free will debate uh, and the debates around free wills. It seems like the two schools have different conceptions of moral responsibility or free will and what is required. And how do we decide who's right? In the end, I'm afraid that we won't have a decisive reason to favor one picture over the other. <laughs> and that an indication of that is the, that the debates over the Frankfurt cases continue 50 years after they were presented. And of course, hundreds of years after the Bishop Bram Hall and John Locke examples, people just disagree. And some people think that when you look carefully at the thought experiments, you will see an alternative possibility, uh, which I call a flicker of freedom, a freedom to do otherwise or choose otherwise, or some sort of alternative possibility. And it's in virtue of that, they claim that the agent is responsible. They think our intuitions about the responsibility of Jones in the actual sequence depends at least implicitly 
on there being some alternative possibility. And then those of us like me who follow the Frankfurtian intuition argue that you can construct the cases in such a way that there aren't relevant alternative possibilities. There may be alternatives, but they're mere flickers of freedom in my view, and therefore not robust enough to ground moral responsibility. Even if you, if you buy into the alternative possibilities or uh, garden of forking past framework, you need, um, as you pointed out, Jason, you need plural voluntariness and the alternative possibilities, the mere flickers of freedom that are left in the Frankfurt cases don't involve plural voluntary sequences. So you can go back and forth. And in the end, I don't know that there's one approach that will be favored by everyone or even should be favored by any, anyone. I think a lot of it depends on whether the Frankfurt cases grab you, whether these cases <clears throat> kind of in, make a strong impression on you intuitively. So earlier you alluded to this distinction between regulatory control and guiding control. And so if we imagine someone who's sitting at uh, the cockpit of an airplane, but the whole process is um, automated. In other words, there is nothing they can do that could change the direction of it, influence what time it lands, none of it. But they're sitting behind the wheel and they're doing this and they're shouting of commands and they're hitting buttons and they have all the sort of feeling that they're making choices and it feels like those choices are having impacts in the world. When they push the buttons, the plane moves in certain directions and they intend it to land and it lands. So I got two concerns. The one is that when we think about the mental states that we go through, it certainly feels as if we're making choices in the world that have repercussions. But if causal determinism is true, that's entirely an illusion. And the other one is that when we talk about these mental states and the deliberation, we're speaking as if this is freedom, that making these choices internally in a mental way is to go through a deliberative process which you can choose. But if causal determinism is true, it seems that that itself is an illusion too, that you could not have deliberated otherwise, that there was only one deliberative path available to you. And so really, you are just sitting along for the ride, uh, making no choices whatsoever. Okay, Mark, I, yeah, you raised a lot of different interesting questions. So the example you discuss is very similar to an example that was put forward by Carl Janet, the Cornell philosopher, who turns out was my supervisor, my thesis supervisor many years ago at Cornell. He has a great example of an amusement car ride. In an amusement park, sometimes they have rides, especially that kids like, that make them feel as though they're controlling a car, but they're actually not. They feel as though they're turning the car, causing the car to go to the right, but that it could have gone to the left. And they have all the phenomenological, as it were, sense, sense or feels or seems to them as if they are driving. But in fact, the gears are really under the control of the machinery and they're not, they're on a track that's just allows the car to go one way. So the amusement car ride is like your pilot case. And you, you could also distinguish between a car that you are actually driving and you are actually exhibiting guidance control, but there's, let's say, uh, there's a way in which another person, maybe the driving instructor can, as it were, take over the controls. He doesn't actually take over the controls, but he could, if he sees it's, there's some problems. That's an interestingly different case. That's like the Frankfurt case in which the agent really is not just at the controls, but controlling the car in the sense of guiding it, even though the driver may not have regulative control, if the driving instructor would intervene and cause the car to go in the direction uh, they want. If things go as you described, it's like the uh, Janae's amusement park ride or your pilot case where the, or uh, a car case where actually it's on automatic pilot and somehow you can't take it off automatic pilot. Sometimes you can set a car to drive at a certain speed 
And of course, typically you can disengage that, but somehow it's broken. You can't, but you don't even know that. In all of those cases, in my view, you're not acting freely. You're not morally responsible. But distinguish those from a case where there's preemptive overdetermination. There's, you're the pilot and you're actually guiding the plane. You, your choices are causing it to go the way it does. But there's an override <laughs> there such that if you were not to do it in a safe way, it would override. And unfortunately, I think that some of those recent crashes involving the Boeing plane, maybe the Malaysian air crash or, or some of those crashes took place because that automatic override system was not working carefully, properly, and the pilots didn't have the training to fix the situation. I'm not sure about the details, but so distinguish between the actual sequence and the alternate sequence, the alternate sequence may render it the case that the pilot or the kid on the amusement car ride couldn't have chosen or done otherwise, but it doesn't actually affect in a problematic way. What happens? What is the relationship between the points I've just been trying to make and causal determinism or the possible truth of God. And what you suggested is if determinism is true, then we're not really making choices at all. It's all an illusion. And what I would claim is we could still make choices. We could still deliberate, though some philosophers resist this. I would say determinism itself does not make it the case that our mind doesn't kind of function the way we think it does. What is though at issue is whether we could still choose otherwise or deliberate otherwise, we'd still be making choices. And in my view, we would still, could still be morally responsible, even if determinism's truth would rule out alternative ways of choosing. So again, that's an important distinct distinction for me. But one last thing I'd like to signal that there is a position called classical compatibilism and the classical compatibilists argue that even if determinism is true, we still could be free to choose and do otherwise in a genuine way. We could still have regulative control. And of course, one of the classic ways of explaining or giving a more specific account of classical compatibilism is in terms of the conditional analysis of freedom, such that if I choose to do one thing, like vote for the Democrat, and I do vote for the Democrat, nevertheless, Let's put aside any counterfactual apparatus, like in the, if it's an ordinary case, even if determinism is true, I could have chosen and done otherwise. And that's because if I had chosen otherwise, I would have done otherwise. Okay. Or if I had deliberated in a certain way, then I would have chosen to vote for the Republican. And if I had chosen to vote for the Republican, I would have, that's all consistent with causal determinism. So although we've been speaking in the incompatibilist way, the way that Jason is attracted to, there are people who would try and defend the existence of freedom to do otherwise or choose otherwise, even in a deterministic world. And there's a parallel point about, uh, or parallel position with regard to theological determinism. So. People have argued that even if God has comprehensive foreknowledge, God knows in advance exactly what I'll choose and do. Nevertheless, I could have, or could choose and do otherwise. And if I had choose chosen to do otherwise, God would have known that God tracks what I choose and what I do. So the mere existence of a, an omniscient God does not necessarily show that I don't have freedom to do it. So that's this position. It adds a certain complexity to the analysis of these cases. So two things. The one is you seem to make a carve out for our mental states. And I wonder why, if our mental states are the products um, of physical processes. In other words, there's a chemical reaction going on in my brain, which gives me this feeling of deliberating, but that is part of a causal sequence. So there is no way I could have deliberated otherwise in the way that I, in other words, there's no firm distinction between the act of deliberating and the act of doing physical things outside of my mind. It, it seems like there's, there's no choices there at all. Again, just further illusions. 
And then I wonder with the God case, it seems that depends on how we think about the nature of the future. So you could have the sort of forking future, as you say, like the, the garden of forking paths. And we can imagine a God that is able to see all of that simultaneously, all the possible options. But, you know, once you crystallize one of those particular choices, reality hardens in that direction. And, uh, you know, maybe it makes a difference if God can know which particular alternative path you're going to pick. In which case the other paths really have no real existence because God knows which, which path all of us will take. And there is only one linear route to the end of time. Good. So that latter picture of God knowing, let's say in advance of decreeing that this world will be the actual world or that a particular world will be the actual world, God has, as it were, metaphorically in his mind, all the different possible worlds. And according to a famous and much discussed view put forward by Louis de Molina, a medieval Jesuit thinker. Um, according to Molinism, God can have prior in his mind, a knowledge of what would happen in every possible scenario, every possible situation in every possible world. And in some of those scenarios, the agent would still be acting freely. And so God could know that if he were to decree this situation be real, the agents would freely do this or that. And God uses this information, sometimes called middle knowledge. He uses this information to decide which world is the best of all possible world and to create that world. So it's this picture. Then there's still, as you put it, that once he creates that world, there's the problem of how his foreknowledge could be consistent with freedom once it's hardened as it were, it's a challenge, but it's a complicated <laughs> dialectic about, um, Molina's views and other views about theological determinism or other responses to theological determinism. But about the carve out, I'm, I'm not making a carve out for the mind. I'm, it's almost like it's a carve in. I'm a materialist or a physicalist about the mind body relationship. And so I think that even if their physical determinism were true, we could still deliberate. It would just be a subset of those physical states. Those neurological states would be interacting and functioning in a, in a way that underwrites our deliberation. I mean, we don't have phenomenal, phenomenological access to those physical states, but as we're choosing, we might believe if we're physicalists that our choice is actually a physical state or supervenes on a physical. So I, I'm not carving out the mental states. They're all part of nature in my view of material nature. And further, even if determinism were true in the physical world, determinism would also be true and applied to the mental world and our world of deliberations. I'm very curious about an empirical question, which I know you're a philosopher, so this is not your job, strictly speaking, but it has it been decided whether determinism is true? No. And as I understand it, there are certain physicists, but you know, it's interesting. It's more philosophers of science and philosophers of physics who ruminate on these issues. It's not so much physicists, but many people believe that at the most fundamental level, perhaps described by quantum mechanics, the world is indeterministic in crucial ways that our the indeterminism is not just epistemic or a matter of our limitations in our knowledge, but these people believe that metaphysics or as part of the way the physical world works, indeterminism obtains. But then there are others who, who believe that the indeterminacies really are just epistemic gaps or gaps in our knowledge and that um, quantum mechanics can be interpreted in such a way that it leaves room for causal determinism. And I don't think yet there's a decisive answer one way or the other. I think David Bohm is a proponent of the more deterministic picture. So I don't think that one view has been established. What one thing that I find appealing about my compatibilism about determinism and moral responsibility is we wouldn't have to give up moral responsibility if it were decisively established that determinism were true. I mean, the 
little uh, story I like to tell is if we were to wake up tomorrow morning to a headline in the newspaper to the effect that causal determinism is true. And, you know, the article says scientists at the top research universities have that causal determinism obtains. Then, of course, we wouldn't be convinced right away, as we know the media can often get things wrong. But uh, let's say over a decade, we there's further study, and in all the academic journals and popular journals, the uh, results are reported, and all of the respectable scientists concur in the conclusion that determinism is true. At that point, I would not be inclined at all to give up my view of myself and others as persons and as morally accountable and as fundamentally different from mere non-human animals and computers. I just wouldn't be inclined to do that, I, not on the basis of that kind of finding. And as Peter Strassen emphasized, our responsibility practices, which are intimately intertwined with our interpersonal relationships, treating others as persons and not just things or mere animals or objects. It's just crucial to the way we live our lives. He, he thought it was inconceivable that we live or exist in a human form without these practices. And so I think a lot hangs on whether you can defend a kind of compatibilist picture and that the jury is still out on determinism. I would want a protection against the possibility, a metaphysical protection or an insurance policy that I could pull out of my coat. So anyway, that's my view that responsibility shouldn't hang on a thread. Let's, let's say I can grant that there is some form of moral responsibility. There's some form of freedom that's happening in a world that's deterministic. Now, I want to take you into the situation where the scientists are about to call a press conference, right? So they've, they've, they've found the answer for whether there is, there is determinism or not. And you're sitting in the audience and they're opening the envelope and they're about to announce it. Perhaps they get like some celebrity to announce whether there's determinism or indeterminism. Uh, maybe Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they get Brad Pitt to, to announce whether there's determinism or indeterminism and you're sitting in the audience, do you have a preference? And I think this is crucial because fine, I'll grant you that there's some moral responsibility, some form of moral responsibility, there's some form of principle of alternative possibilities that holds up and some form of freedom that holds up in a deterministic world, but isn't it not as good as the indeterministic world? Isn't it not as attractive? And, and when you're sitting in your seat, won't you be hoping that Brad Pitt says, actually, it turns out there's indeterminism. And won't you be a bit disappointed if Brad Pitt says, no, it's deterministic. Excellent. Great question. And I would say, no, I have no preference at all. And I would just hope that he doesn't make a mistake. There was a famous <laughs> instance at the, uh, the Academy Awards in Hollywood a couple of years ago where uh, there was a terrible mistake in the announcement of best picture, but let's, uh, but even if he were to make a mistake and go back and correct, it wouldn't matter uh, to me in terms of moral responsibility now, but let me, let me, and I think that's a good thought experiment on behalf of my view, or at least it illustrates the way I think about these cases. Not only would I not change my mind if, if it were announced in the newspapers and the scholarly journals that determinism were true. I wouldn't be waiting on the edge of my seat. I wouldn't be thinking to myself, if the announcement is that determinism is false, then I can continue to love my children and my wife in a certain specific way and hold others, murderers accountable. But if Brad Pitt says, it turns out determinism is true, then I would have to stop thinking of these individuals as in important and deep ways special. I just wouldn't think that way. And I would say if determinism is true and incompatibilism is true, so classical compatibilism is false, we would lose something and we would lose a kind of freedom that we believe we have. And that's kind of deeply embedded in our ordinary and even more theoretical ways of conceptualizing human behavior. We'd lose regulative control or freedom to choose and do otherwise. And, and yet we really, we believe we have that. So we wouldn't have as much 
as we would under certain alternative theories like indeterminism, possibly if you can solve the luck problem for indeterminism, we would lose something. We wouldn't have as much freedom, but, and you use the term as good, it wouldn't be as good. And that's where I get off the butter. That's where we disagree because I think you wouldn't have as much, but you would have as good. You would have all the freedom that's required for moral responsibility. Yes, we would be turned out. We would be deluded when we deliberate, but that delusion doesn't really affect our deliberation. We'd still deliberate in the same way. And the fact that our deliberations are actually determined, that's not accessible to us at all. And if they were determined and classical compatibilism is false, then, or any other kind of compatibilism about regulative control, then it will turn out that whatever I choose, I couldn't have chosen otherwise, but I could still choose freely. So we'd have to kind of rethink the way we describe deliberation and make sense of it, but we could still keep it pretty much intact. So quick answer. No, I would not be on the edge of my seat. Second, yes, we would lose something if uh, determinism were true. We wouldn't have as much freedom, but we would have enough freedom. That's what I want to say. So I want to give you another classic thought experiment. So Nozick has this experience machine. He says, imagine you get into the experience machine and we're going to manipulate it such that it's, it's a ride. You will have these experiences. It'll feel like you're making choices. The experiences can be absolutely delightful. It could be pre-programmed for different things so that you have unending pleasure, or maybe you've got to overcome certain obstacles, but it's, it's a total ride. It's none of it is rooted in reality. And a lot of people say, well, they wouldn't choose to enter the experience machine because they want to actually be making those achievements. They want to actually be right to the novel, climbing the mountain, etc. But I would think that if your view on whether we have a deterministic universe or an indeterministic universe is flip a coin, it doesn't really matter. I would assume the same must hold for the experience machine. We say, well, I'm kind of in a ride right now. So whether it's a ride in a virtual world in the experience machine, or whether it's in this actual world, flip a coin, it doesn't matter. Excellent question. And uh, one thing quickly, Robert Nozick was giving lectures at Harvard at about the same time that Harry Frankfurt was thinking about these cases and published and Frankfurt points out in a footnote that he understands that Nozick independently had developed these cases, which is interesting. Um, yeah, the experience machine is a great thought experiment. And I believe that if you were involuntarily and unbeknownst to you hooked up to an experience machine of the kind Mark describes, uh, you wouldn't be acting freely and you wouldn't be living a meaningful life in my view. Acting freely is part, though not all of living a meaningful life in my view. Now, how's that different from having certain significant uh, delusions about one's freedom status. Well, I think you're still fundamentally in contact with reality. Your conceptualization of part of it, uh, is incorrect. Now, as we actually live our lives, we're wrong about things We're we're deluded or we're not correct. We either lack information or we are, you know, deceived about how things are. And some of those are important. And yet I think we can still live meaningfully. Now, if our entire lives were illusions, either produced by being in an experienced machine or for some other reason, hypnotized or manipulated, then I think we wouldn't be genuinely free and living a meaningful life. We would just believe we were. So just as an example, there's uh, work in psychology that shows that people who are deluded about how others think about themselves can be happier than people than people who have an accurate view. So if you believe your spouse or your partner or your friends find you very, very attractive, then you're going to be happier or find you funny or brilliant. You're going to be happier. And many times we're wrong about those, uh, but the happy people tend to be deluded about those things. And the depressed people tend to be more in contact with reality about the way other people perceive. And those are important matters. So we can be deceived about important matters. 
And we can lack information about all sorts of things. Obviously, I mean, how many books are there in those bookshelves behind me? I have no, I mean, I have a rough idea, but I don't know the exact number. It doesn't matter to me. So things that matter to me, things that don't matter to me, I can be wrong or fail to be in contact with the specifics. And yet I can still be free. Now, what you're pointing out is if I were to discover that I don't have regulative control, I, that my view of myself as living in a garden of forking paths, as it were, that that's wrong. That would be a much bigger deal than finding, uh, than other things, than finding out that my friends really don't find me as amusing as I think they do. And they're just laughing to make, to, to make me feel that it's a big deal. And I agree. Let me just put it this way. It's, it's one reason why an actual sequence theory is so interesting. It would change our, it changes our conceptualization, our third party, as it were, theorizing. But if you were to discover it as an agent yourself, it would have to change the way you conceptualize it. It might not change your practices, but it's a radical thesis. I agree. But it's not so radical as to entail that living in an experience machine would still involve freedom or responsibility. As you know, the Matrix films do explore some of these themes. I mean, some of them are about how we could know. First one is how we can, how we can know that we're not a brain in a vat or in a matrix. But a later film explores freedom. I don't think you can know that you're not a brain in a vat. And I don't know, certainly in a matrix, you wouldn't know that you're free. So I want to just explore something you just said now and alluded to earlier. So Brad Pitt takes the, the, the announcement out the envelope and he says, there is determinism. You said one of the consequences of that is that we would realize that we're deluded at least some of the time in our deliberation. So we would realize that at least some of the time we believe that we could have acted otherwise in a way that we can't. Now, does that render everyone in that press conference listening to Brad Pitt as unfree? So. In other words, is compatibilism true only if you don't know about compatibilism and, and you don't know that freedom, that, that determinism is true? I, I think that what you, one of the issues that you just raised was how to think about the Frankfurt cases. And one thing that's true in every one of them is that you don't know about the existence of the Frankfurt style counter, uh, counterfactual intervener. The, so you don't know about the neuro neurosurgeon who's, uh, monitoring the situation. So a certain kind of ignorance seems required for the examples to really work. Now, if you believe that in those specific examples, you have moral responsibility without freedom to do otherwise, that would seem to suggest that Moral responsibility does not, in general, require freedom to do otherwise. There's something else that's closely related to freedom to do otherwise that, in fact, grounds responsibility generally. So I think, in general, there's no requirement of ignorance or anything like that. But, you know, I tell you, I mean, it's an excellent question, and I'm not sure exactly how to answer because there is this problem. Look, deliberation still makes sense. Even if I know that I can't do anything, I can't choose anything different from what I actually will choose, and I can't do anything different from what, what I actually will do. It makes sense if I do not know what I will choose and what I, well, uh, what I will do. I still have a certain ignorance, even though I uh, know that perhaps because of determinism or as of God's foreknowledge and the falsity of compatibilistic analyses of the re relevant kind of freedom to do otherwise. I know all that, and therefore I've taken philosophy. <laughs> I've taken a senior seminar at free will, and I know all of that. And plus I'm convinced determinism is true or God is it. I can still deliberate and it makes sense to deliberate. It's very important because I don't know what I will choose. I mean, here's an example. Let's say I'm taking a walk here in 
Southern California. It's a beautiful day, even though it's in the middle of uh, winter, it's a gorgeous day and there's a path in the path. Uh, there's a fork in the path and on the right fork, I see a rattlesnake coiling up, looking rather disturbed. And then on the other path, it's just no snake, no other obstacle, beautiful views. I deliberate. I mean, I'm not going to sit there and say, uh, oh, whatever I choose, I won't be able to choose. Otherwise I have to do what I do. Um, so I'm not even going to deliberate. I'm just going to flip a coin. I'm just on a whim. We'll go one way or the other. That would be crazy. I mean, there's a point in evaluating the situation, seeking to figure out what's best and then seeking to conform my choice and action to that evaluation. So that's what, I mean, I think that even if you don't have alternatives and you know that there's still a point to deliver it now. If you tell me, but now you, you know, not only that you have no alternatives, but you know, specifically and precisely what you're going to choose and do. That's where I don't know what to say. Some philosophers have defended the idea that it still makes sense to make, uh, deliberate and choose, but I'm not sure about that. that and that seems to me the kind of situation that you're pushing toward. Yeah. So but two questions. The first is imagine that we had some level of precognition. And so you could see into the future an hour always. And so you knew exactly what you were going to do for the next hour. And that was how it was. You'd have the experience of engaging with the world, but you'd know that you had no, no ability to change any of the controls. It just whatever happens to you happens to you and you have perfect foreknowledge forever. And that seems like it would be uh, undermining the quality of your life in a lot of ways. And there might be some a uh, blessing in the ignorance. There, there's a Nicolas Cage movie like this. I, I don't think it's an hour for him. I think it's 30 seconds or 15 seconds or something. But yeah, there's a movie just like this. Yeah, I would imagine in some senses, if it was even shorter, it could just, it could feel like you were constantly, you know, having reverse deja vu all the time. You know exactly what's going to happen and you can't help but it happening. The second question is this, which is you talked about how we ground moral responsibility. So if I think about two cases of someone killing another person, <laughs> So you have one where uh, I I plot to kill Jason. I craft and think all the sorts of different ways which I'm going to do it. And I decide the best way to do it is for me to sneak up behind him with a knife and stab him rapidly in the back. The other version is that I'm standing behind Jason with a knife and I have an epileptic fit. And involuntarily, I stab him to death. Now, from the outside perspective, they look identical. And we traditionally want to say that I am morally responsible in the first case, but not morally responsible in the second. But if it's the case that when through all the plotting and the act of, of doing the stabbing, I really had no free choice. I could not have done otherwise. I was set on a, on a course. It's as if I were having an epileptic fit throughout my life. There is no real voluntariness. But nonetheless, we want to hold that, ver that version of events as morally responsible. What's doing the work? Why are we holding the person responsible, not the other one? Good. I'm going to focus on the second question first. What I would like to claim is that even in a deterministic world, we can sometimes uh, hold someone responsible, whereas other times they're not. So not all causally deterministic sequences are created equal from the perspective of moral responsibility. Now, the classical view is sometimes, even if your choice and action is determined, nevertheless, you could have chosen otherwise and, and done otherwise. And that's the idea that distinguishes the cases in which we are responsible from those in which we're not. And when you have an epileptic seizure and you act voluntarily during that time, you couldn't have chosen otherwise, couldn't have done otherwise. And that's why we think that you are not responsible, but in an ordinary case, you could have chosen and done otherwise. So that's the classical view. I have a different perspective, especially because it's not clear if we were determined, it's not clear that determinism is false. And if determinism is true, maybe we didn't have those choices uh, to do otherwise or those capacities to do otherwise. So what I want to say is sometimes you exhibit guidance control and sometimes you don't in a deterministic world. Then I have to give an account, or I should give an account in order to make my view uh, more filled in. What I want to say is sometimes you act from your own reasons, responsive mechanism. So when you act from a owned reason sensitive mechanism, then you can be held 
responsible as long as epistemic conditions are met, you know what you're doing and so forth. But so my contention is that if you think of all the stock examples in which intuitively we would not hold someone responsible, that they have an epileptic uh, seizure, they sneeze and, and hit someone, they're secretly being manipulated through subliminal advertising or direct stimulation of the brain, they have a gun to their head and they are coerced into doing what they do, they, they have a phobia. All of these stock examples, which we think are special cases and which the classical compatible says, well, the agent couldn't have done other. What I want to say is in those cases, they don't exhibit guidance control. They don't act from their own reasons, responsive mechanism. So that's the way I would distinguish uh, a case of, let's say, epileptic um, involuntary action from a so-called normal or ordinary case. So determinism in itself doesn't imply that all cases are like in the relevant sense. And causal determinism, in my view, is totally compatible with reasons, responsiveness, and with ownership. Now, all of that is controversial, but those are my views. Now, let me just say, if you see a, yourself, like in the film, if you see somehow you have precognition and you know, you know, you believe with certainty and justification, you know exactly what you will choose and do for the next hour, then that's it. There's no further question about <clears throat> what you should do. <clears throat> There's no point really in engaging in any deliberation. I mean, if you do engage, in other words, the question is prior to that hour, should you engage in deliberation? Uh, not clear that there's a point to it at all. And I think that if our lives, if you generalize to our lives as a whole, let's say right now, if you, if there were a book of my life and I could read it and I could see exactly what I will choose and do at every moment for the rest of my life, um, there's no point now in my deliberating about it in my saying, well, this afternoon, shall I go to the library or should I go to the coffee house? After that, should I make my dinner at home? Should we go out? There's just no point to it because I will already have read that I will do a, a certain sequence of things. I think the point of deliberation is when I don't know what I'll choose. But in such a world where you're not deliberating, surely you're not A, morally responsible for your choices and B, free. But, and here's the, the big important point is that such a world is entirely consistent with determinism. And so it seems that at least in some deterministic worlds, we're not free or morally responsible. Yes. In some deterministic worlds, we're neither free nor morally responsible. We're not free to do otherwise. We don't act freely. We don't exhibit either regulative or guidance. Those are deterministic worlds in which the sequences go in a certain way that rules out ownership or reasons, responsiveness. But the, then there are some deterministic worlds like ours where some of the sequences are responsibility conferring and others responsibility eliminating. Um, I certainly don't claim that in our world, we're always free and responsible. Now, again, are we free in a deterministic world? I think it's a uh, distinguish two questions. Do we deliberate freely? Do we choose freely? Do we act freely? Do we exhibit guidance control? Distinguish that from, are we free to choose otherwise? Are we free to do otherwise? And both questions are contentious. That is, some people do think that in a deterministic world, we wouldn't have alternative questions, but others deny that. So all I was trying to say was determinism might still leave room for leeway uh, in certain conditions, not all. But I, I mean, I call myself a semi-compatibilist and I myself am attracted to your view about freedom to do otherwise or regulatory. I'm attracted and if, and on most days I would ag agree with you that determinism and God's foreknowledge or, and or God's foreknowledge would rule out regulative control. But I would insist that it doesn't thereby rule out guidance control. 